Nolan Demar Sullivan, um, who has a beautiful name, is uh, going to talk about getting uh, open API spec ready for code generation. Uh, Nolan is head of developer relations at Speakeasy, and his work is to um, make it easy to create and consume any API. And I'm seeing a lot of um, uh, friends uh, on supporters of the <laughs> API docs in the audience. Hi, Nolan. Hey, sorry about that. I just had to leave and rejoin for my camera and mic to work. That happens. It's great that you could, and the stage yeah. is yours. Cool. All right. Uh, thank you for the intro. Probably said it much better than I would have. And I can just jump into the content, and I'll try and get us uh, back on track. That is me with shorter hair before I worked at a startup. And yeah, things got busy. Um, OK. So today I'm going to talk about try and give some really practical advice around how you can manage your open API spec and get it optimized for doing code gen. And a lot of the tips that I'll be giving should also be the things that uh, can make your API more accessible to AI as well, uh, which is increasingly becoming important. I think I saw in the chat that someone said, you know, you should treat an AI user as you would a, a normal user. And I think that that's pretty good advice. And a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about is basically how do you make your API easily understandable to people from outside your organization? Okay. So to start, what is code gen? What am I referring to when I say code gen? And why should you care about it? So to me, and part of this is the work I do at Speakeasy, but you know, we work on client library generation, and that's that's really what I'm referring to when I say code gen. There are lots of different forms that there are lots of different types of code that you could generate, but when I say it, I'm talking about SDKs. Um, and that's really just a way of making your API accessible to your users in their native language, like the coding language that they work in day to day. Um, so why are SDKs, client libraries, why are they useful? Uh, people with SDKs, your users are going to have a faster time to production 200. So that's the time that it takes them from learning about your API to actually making a call successfully in production. SDKs are probably the single best thing that you can provide to, to shorten that time. Um, they also help with scaling API usage. Uh, they make support significantly easier. That's because SDKs constrain the, or they they narrow the way that people are integrating with your API. And I actually think this is more important with AI becoming so popular. Um, if everyone was using AI to integrate with your API, you're going to have because it's non-deterministic. You're going to get, you know, a thousand users are going to have a thousand different ways that the, they integrate with the API. But if you provide an SDK, it basically narrows the aperture of all the different ways that you could integrate, and the code should start to look similar user to user. Um, and that's going to save you a lot of time on the troubleshooting front. Um, and finally, like if obviously this is maybe the most important, but having SDK means more money and happier users. And that's again, goes back to the time to production 200. Lots of studies show that the faster that someone can actually start making a successful API request, um, the longer, or the more money you get over the lifetime of that customer um, and the happier they are, the more likely they are to add new use cases because they had a good experience the first time they interacted with your API. Okay, so where does AI fit in? Um, LLMs today are using open API specs to understand your API. Um, just like, and as I said before, like the things that lead to good code generation are the same things that help AI performance. And that's because code generation requires a higher level of um, competence in the open API spec. Like if there are issues with your open API spec, they're going to be exposed when you try to do code generation. So if you can get your spec to the point where it's generating good, clean code, then that's also at the point where it's going to be um, very easy for an AI or a human user even um, to go and look at your open API spec and understand it and um, understand how to use it. Uh, and the things that you can take 
uh, to actually turn your spec into something that is readable. Uh, make sure you stick to conventions when you're naming things and make sure that the names are actually meaningful to people and AI. Uh, and wherever possible, you want to reuse code. And I'm going to go into all details about how all of this works in just a sec. Um, but before I do, uh, this is something that I often send to clients. I call it the Pooh Bear Open API Sophistication Scale. Uh, it might be familiar to a lot of you who have worked at various organizations with different levels of adoption of Open API. At the very beginning, uh, you have people who are maintaining an Open API spec just because it's mandated by the leadership team. The next level of sophistication is maintaining an Open API spec to keep your docs up to date. That's probably where most organizations are today. Um, where the open API spec is, you know, some level of maintained. Uh, and then the last one where I think everyone should be trying to get to is maintaining an open API spec that you can use to build libraries, uh, which power internal and external uh, API development and power AI code pilots. All right. Uh, and really quick, just some organizational pitfalls that people have to overcome even before you can start making the changes that get you a good spec. Uh, you need to have an open API spec, of course. Um, I see a lot of companies that don't, and usually it's not because they don't want to, it's just they're kind of procrastinating and putting it off. And the way that they justify this is that they haven't decided if they want to hand maintain it or if they want to generate it. Uh, my solution to this is you just pick one, try both, find out what sticks. Every org is going to be different. Um, I don't think that people should be really um, opinionated about this. Like, I, I, obviously, there are some people who feel very strongly that things should be maintained by hand and the spec should be designed before the API. Um, I think that's that's great if you can do it in theory, but you know, it's better to have a generated spec than to not have one at all. So I wouldn't be too precious about it. Um, and then for people who have open API specs, I think the biggest blocker on the org level that we see before they make the jump to doing code generation is something along the lines of, uh, we need a governance workflow before we can do code generation. Basically what they're saying is our spec, we don't feel confident in the quality of our spec enough to go to the next level and actually start doing some code generation because we think that the, there are inaccuracies in the spec or the spec lags um, the API. And yeah, usually people will also say that, well, the reason why people aren't invested is because we don't have any critical workflows using the spec. And it's this kind of like chicken and egg situation. Um, you know. You don't build critical workflows with the spec because you don't have the governance workflow. Nobody's invested in the governance because there are no critical workflows. So uh, I think just bite the bullet and do it. Um, it's once you start to demonstrate some value and you can start small, just a couple of endpoints. You have a couple of endpoints which are held to a really high quality and you can use them for code gen. Uh, suddenly, the developers on the team understand the value of actually investing in the open API spec, and you're going to get a lot less resistance um, when you talk about the importance of maintaining the spec. So uh, let's keep going. All right, so now onto the spec itself and how you can actually, on a very tactical basis, like how can you make your spec ready for code gen? So, first thing, and there's little animations on the side, which hopefully will show you like how you can, what the changes in the spec look like when they get translated to code. So you can just watch those as I talk. Um, but yeah, operation IDs are a big one. Um, for almost any code gen tool, the operation ID is used to name the method calls. So you, again, want to make them descriptive and something human readable. Uh, this is especially important if you are generating your spec from, a, from code. Uh, a lot of the tools that I've seen that do generation of specs, they give the operation IDs these crazy names. Um, so just watch out for that. Uh, yeah, follow a consistent pattern for every endpoint in your spec. Stick to alphanumerics and just use a simple separator. Like don't have numbers, don't put like V1, V2, V3, 
all that junk um, because if you're doing code gen, it's going to get really ugly. And this is kind of what you want to strive for. Verb, object, keep it simple. All right. Um, yeah, we're using component schemas when possible. This is really about making it easier to maintain your spec in the long run, but it also has a lot of bearing on code generation. So again, if you're using a, if you're generating your spec from your API code base, you need to watch out for this. A lot of the defaults will be that they'll just generate uh, like inline schemas for the responses. And again, that can lead to not as nice of an experience when you're using a code generator because you'll basically end up with all of these duplicated objects, which all represent really the same thing. Um, and if you use component schemas in their, your open API spec, basically means that if there are any changes to an object, you can change it in one place, it'll automatically update. Um, so for all of the endpoints in the spec that reference that same component schema, um, and it'll make your code more readable when you do code generation, because everyone will be referring to that same object. Okay, tags. Um, this is something that's optional in OpenAPI, but I highly recommend that you include it when you're planning to do code generation. Um, typically, for most code gen tools, the tags are used to group things into namespaces. So you can imagine, like in my example, you could, if you had uh, different operations that corresponded to a drinks element, like you could have uh, create a drink, list a drink, get a drink. Um, delete doesn't really make sense that uh, example. But anyway, you would want to tie those all together and say these all correspond to one resource, where resource is like some sort of logical grouping. Um, and tags is how you do that in OpenAPI. So make sure you add them before you do code generation. It's going to make it way easier for people to look at a library and then grok, uh, like what are the different resources that they can manipulate in your API and what are the operations that they can use for doing that manipulation. Uh, and again, same things uh, apply, just use hum human readable names. Um, and again, try and think about it from your user's perspective, like how are they gonna see your API and the different resources? Okay. Uh, Another important one is error codes. Yeah, don't shy away from failure when you're doing your open API spec. Again, this is something that I see when people are using their spec just for documentation, I often see that they leave these out. Like they only show the 200 case because they want to educate people about what the response object is going to look like. Um, but when you're doing code generation, uh, how you handle failure is extremely important because typically people are going to fail quite a few times before they succeed. And the way that they experience the failure, like is there something helpful coming from the other side, can actually do a lot more to endear them to using your API than what happens when they're successful. So yeah, don't skip this part, it's super important. Um, and in terms of how you can actually do it, just define, define like shared error response codes for all, your, for all of the endpoints in your API. Um, and in your code gen tool, that'll then mean that they can generate error objects in the different languages that you're supporting. Okay, uh, and I think this is the last one. Uh, in OpenAPI, there are these one of, any of, all of, um, just don't use any of. Uh, it doesn't really work well in code gen, and the reason is that any of is kind of saying uh, it could be one or more of any of these things. And in a code gen context, if you were to actually take that literally, you could, you know, have exponent or not, not exponential, but combinatoric generation of different object types for all the different mixes. Um, and yeah, most code generators won't handle it. Uh, so typically just stink just stick to one of like if it's going to be A or B, use one of that's the most widely supported of these terms uh, that are used in OpenAPI. So just use that. Cool. So yeah, this is a summary. Make operation IDs human readable. Uh, use component schemas wherever possible. So you know, abstract things away into shared resources. 
Um, use tags to group things. Don't skip error responses. They're super important. And don't use any of them. Just use one of them. Uh, and then just a couple of resources that might be helpful if you guys are actively working on OpenAPI. Um, this is something that we actually just recently rolled out. So we've written an OpenAPI reference. Um, it goes through all the different pieces of the spec and gives kind of practical advice like I've been doing in this talk. Uh, I guess to just segue into the next talk that's going to be going on, which I think is Nick Gomez from Inkeep. Uh, this reference is actually built using Inkeep. So there is a little AI uh, widget at the top, and you can ask it any open API question. And it's trained on all the reference materials that we've written. And so it should be able to answer all of your queries. So check it out. It should be pretty useful. And if you are looking to do uh, code generation, if you're trying to build SDKs for your API, I've convinced you that this is a great idea. Um, come talk to me. I'll be hanging out in the lobby. Um, you know, Speakeasy is one tool. There's plenty of open source tools. The brief difference is just Speakeasy is intended for API, APIs that are um, going to be used at an enterprise level. Uh, a lot of the OSS projects are great, but they aren't really to the up to snuff for enterprise usage. Uh, and there's a full list at openapi.tools. So, that is that. I think I clawed back a couple of minutes. Thank you, Nolan, um, also for hurrying and for your very pragmatic, you know, just do it. Pick one, try it, try the other one, um, and all the practical tips. Um, if you're okay with that, I would like uh, Mike to um, maybe converse about the merits of SDKs in the lounge area with you. Sure. And um, Michal is asking, uh, what about cross API code generation? Cross API code generation? Mm -hmm. um, I am not sure, entirely sure what it refers to, but if it means like doing code generation that uses APIs from multiple API providers, um, I think that that's an interesting case. Uh, typically, we work from the producer standpoint, like building tooling for people who build APIs. This is that question is more about like from the consumer point of view. I think that definitely we're going to see um, like that's going to be a place where AI is super important. Um, and I don't know, looking like further down the road, I do see a scenario where SDKs become less of something that a producer maintains and more of something that is maintained on the API consumer side. Um, and like an API consumer has a way that they integrate with third party APIs and it's kind of bundled together to follow some consistent format. Um, but yeah, that's kind of thoughts there. Okay, cool. Thank you very much and see you in the lounge also. All right, cheers.